Get it in. We don't go on to get started. <laughs> Apologize for all that, but but like I said, the other folks mess with it. It kind of like throw you off. Okay, we're not too late. This is a short one. Uh, Belinda just got some reading to do. Uh, this is and I'm gonna put this over here. I didn't want to be on this thing. Okay. Uh, this we're in Jeremiah chapter 29. Wow, we've come a long way. Um, so we're going to go on and get started. I pray first, and then this chapter, you're going to read the entire chapter. All the way through. Um, mm -hmm. The chapter 21, you're just going to go straight through it um, so that it'll flow, flow and flow and flow because it's actually just a letter. That's what this is. So that's why I rather prefer to just read it straight through because it's a letter. That's all tw chapter 29 is. So let me pray and then we're going to go on and get started. Um, Lord God, this evening we come before you seeking word, seeking understanding, seeking insight, and seeking wisdom. We ask, Lord, that you bless us with these as we study that what the prophet Jeremiah is saying to us this evening. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and shut in, for those who are incarcerated, for those who are bereaved, and for those who are without homes or unchurched. Lord, right now we would like to lift up uh, Belinda's family, especially Icy. Help her to understand um, what she, what, uh, what's happening now. Help her to understand what's happening now, and Lord, be there to comfort her because she is a young child, and um, she probably does not truly understand everything that's going on. So, Lord, just be with her. Um, come, give her the comfort that she needs. Uh, let her cry on your shoulder because she will be doing that just as Jesus wept. So, Lord, just comfort her. Be with her. Uh, be with her family and give them the, two, the necessary tools they need so that they can be a comfort to her. Lord God, we praise you for creating this world. We praise you for all the benefits that you allow us. We praise you for your unending love toward us. We praise you because you are God and you are worthy to be praised. We praise you because you are our provider. We praise you because you are our protector. We praise you because you are a healer. We praise you because you are our way maker. We praise you because you are the God who made a way out of no way. We praise you because you picked us up, Lord. You turned us around and you placed our feet on solid ground. We praise you, Lord, because you simply care about us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, so this is actually a letter. Jeremiah chapter 29 is a letter that uh, Jeremiah wrote, and then some other guy wrote it, and we'll look at all that. So that's why I just wanted her to just read it kind of straight through so that you can get the gist of it. It won't be me breaking in and talking and all that stuff. So she's going to read it. and. Um, a lot of it you're going to, uh, we've already went over some of the stuff and you'll recognize it as she's reading. So, and you know Jeremiah is a book of repetition just like uh, Isaiah was a book of repetition. And that's because it was for us to keep re reading it in the, so that we, that it kept repeating so that we can read it because God wanted us to understand what was going on. And he wanted us to understand, because this is all about the exile. This is, you know, prophet talking and people not understanding. Um, so he wanted us to really get this, and that's why he had him to repeat it so many times, because of the sin that they were committing. And he wanted us to not, you know, be as they were. Even though these were the Israelites and we were, they were supposed to be our examples. So now God is saying this is not the way they're supposed to be. So it's like he's wanting us to see this, you know, understand this. This is not the way we're supposed to be. So there's a lot of repetition. Over and over again. Mm -hmm. That's why he, he, he did it like this, because he knew that we were not going to be able to understand it, you know. And so and that's why there's a lot of repetition, and that's why Jeremiah just kept repeating himself. And Isaiah, the major prophets, you'll find, all those major prophets, Ezekiel, you'll find that they all were repeating themselves a lot. But always remember, you got major prophets, you got minor prophets, and the minor prophets are just as important as the major prophets. The only difference is the length. 
That's the only difference. The, the, the importance is the same. They were all preaching basically the same message, repent. You know, stop all this sin and because idolatry was going on. Because all these prophets now were uh, basically around at the same time. You know, it wasn't like Isaiah came, then he died, and then Jeremiah came, and then he died, and then Daniel came, you know, and uh, Ezekiel came, then he died, and then Daniel came, then he died, you know. And those were the four majors, and then you got the rest minor. But that's not how it happened. They were prophesizing. You had the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, and you may have two of them up there, two of them down there, you know, basically at the same time. And then, you know, that's how you may have a major prophet up here, a minor prophet, you know, up there with him, and then another minor prophet. Then down here you may have two or three major prophets. You know, and up here is northern kingdom, down there is southern kingdom, you know, Israel and Judah. So you had them going like that. So always keep that in mind. They're all going around the same time. Now, some of them, you know, you will have this one died and then this one came on the scene. You know, of course, that, but that's, this one may have lived 70 years and then this one came along, you know. This one may have lived 10 years, 50, no, not 10 years, but let's just say uh, 50 years, and then this one came along. So you did have them like that, but you didn't have uh, all of them just one, then one, then one, then one. It wasn't like uh, the king, I mean the judges, you know, where God would raise up one when this one died, raise up one when this one died. It wasn't like that because the people were constantly sinning. Here they are constantly sinning. The prophets are there, but they are not listening to them. So that's what this is. So, uh, But right now we're at Jeremiah 29, and this is a letter that Jeremiah uh, wrote, uh, and like I said, somebody else wrote part of it, and we'll see all that because I'll, I'll show you the breakdown. But she is going to read Jeremiah chapter 29, the entire chapter, so 1 through 32. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remainder elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was the king, I'm sorry. Jeconiah. This was the king, this was. Jeconiah, and the queen mother, the court officials, the letters of Judah and Jerusalem. The artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisha, son of Saphan, and Jamarat, son of Halkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, it said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build, <coughs> build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For it is welfare you will find, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who, who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not to harm you, to harm, for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon the Lord and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into. Because you have said, 
the Lord has raised up prophets for me, for us in Babylon. Thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who live in this city, your kinfolk who did not go out with you into exile. Okay, you can breathe for a minute. I know you're tired. <laughs> Let me know when you're ready or if you need somebody else to read. You ready? Okay. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm going to let those on, let loose on them sword, family, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like rotten figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with the pestilence, and will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be an object of cursing and horror and hissing and a derision among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they did not heed any word, says the Lord, when I persistently sent to you my servants, the prophets, but they would not listen, says the Lord. But now all you exiles whom I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, son of Kaliah and Hedekiah, son of Messiah, who uh, prophesied and lied to you in my name. I am going to deliver them into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and he shall kill them before your eyes. And on account of them, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah and Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they have perpetrated outrage in Israel and have committed adultery with the neighbor's wives and have spoken in my name lying words that I did not command them. I am the one who knows and bears witness, says the Lord. To Shemaiah of Net. Nehalem, you shall say, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, in your name, in your own name, you sent a letter to all the people who are in Jerusalem, and to the priest Zephaniah, son of Mes Messiah. Messiah, and all the priests, saying, The Lord himself has made you priests instead of the priest Jehadi. Je so that there may be officers in the house of the Lord to control any madman who plays the prophet, to put him in the stocks and the, and the collar. So now, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anakim, who plays the prophet for you, for you? For he has actually sent to us in Babylon, saying, it will be a long time build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat what they produce. The priest Zephaniah read this letter in the hearing of the prophet Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, sent to all the exiles, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah of Nehalem, because Shemaiah has prophesied for you, though I did not send him, and and has led you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am going to punish Shemaiah of Nehalem and his descendants. He shall not have anyone living among this people to see the God that I am going to do to my people. Says the Lord, for he has spoken rebellion against the Lord. Wow. Y'all seen how much God was talking up in this? Thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. You know, when you see that, that means God is speaking and stuff. He said that so many times. He was really trying to get a point across. So this is when the, uh, they're actually in exile. So this is a letter that Jeremiah wrote to the people in exile. So chapter 29 is a letter. Okay, so the whole chapter is a letter. Um, and, and like I said, God was really trying to talk to them and tell them, 
some things. And he was doing it, of course, through his prophet Jeremiah. And you can remember we've already about the false prophets and all this. So this is full of several people in here are false. They're false prophets. They're over in uh, Babylon. Jeremiah's telling them how to live while they're in Babylon. He's telling them how to live while they are in. You should have had that on Sunday. While they were in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was telling them how to live. That's why he told them to build houses, to plant gardens and all that. So he's telling them how to live while they were in exile. So they had freedom to move around and stuff like that, you know, while they were in Babylon. But remember how they did when they came and, 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 and uh, took them. They were killing up any and everybody that they saw that would not, you know, go along with them. So. They, 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 were, they were actually treacherous or ruthless. They were bad, you know, when they came over and got them. So, of course, you know, I mean, before they got them, they fought for like three years out there. And, you know, because, uh, uh, because Judah is fortified, you know, Jerusalem was a fort had a fortified wall. So they had to fight to get in. And it took them about three years before they could even breach the wall. So, uh, and you know, they were doing it. That's why they went through famine, because they starved them, basically, because they cut off their water supply. And that's how you, you could get to them. You do uh, what they call it, a conduit, you know, uh, that they have. And it's like a little bridge and stuff. We saw one when I went to Israel. But anyway, uh, that's the water supply go, was going underground. I went down there, oh my goodness. But it's dark and stuff, but they got lights. <laughs> but I wouldn't have never got any water if I was back then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to go down underground and stuff, so they, they blocked the water supply. And uh, that's why they were so thirsty. You know, animals were dying, they were dying. Livestock, you know, we've already read that and this, you know, talked a little bit about it. But, uh, and then their food, of course, they uh, wasn't growing right. They, they started starving. They had a famine going on because they couldn't get water to their stuff. And then, of course, they started dying from pestilence, which are plagues and diseases and stuff. So on top of all that, you had this army that was still killing people, still killing folks all the time. But God warned them and told them that this was going to happen. So he said they were going to die by the sword. They were going to die by pestilence. They were going to die by famine. And that's what was going on. But they were still a hard-headed people. Because you had some people, you know, you did have some righteous people there, you know. Just like in this world today, we got righteous people. But we also have those evil people. And, and, and one of the biggest problems is when you have evil people that are in office, that are in position. Because they're the ones that are running things. They're supposed to be fair to their people that are the subjects or the people that are under them. And uh, just like those kings, you had the kings, you had the what prince, you had the, the court officials, you had all those people that were the priests, the prophets, all them people that were in position, but they were mean and they were oppressing the people. We have people now that are in office, you know, but they are still, you know, they do not do right by their people. Uh, they were oppressing people back then with, you know, with their greed and, and, and you know, what is it, the, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. So even back then, we see that now. Politicians, it's all about that money. So they tell you whatever they want to tell you to get in office, and then they start doing this. Back then, you remember over in Israel, they kill you and go to office. You know, someone, remember one king didn't last but a couple of hours, you know, and they, they killed him and dethroned him, and they took over, you know. So you had all this, basically what was going, what's going on now was going, there's but nothing new under the sun. So Jeremiah, you know, all this is going on. And, of course, remember, Jeremiah was this weeping prophet. He cried, you know, he cried to the Lord. He prayed to the Lord. Even after God said, stop praying for them people and all that. So he prayed for so long, then he finally started praying for himself, you know. And, and that's when he was telling God, now, Lord, you know I'm not over there drinking with them. Lord, you know I'm not over there seeing them women with them. Lord, you know I'm not doing this, doing that, doing this, doing that. I'm over here praying to you. I'm over here in my little corner, you know. And all that, so he started praying on, on his own behalf. Then he started even kind of feeling guilty because it was like, now I'm just being selfish. I'm praying for me versus praying for my people. But God told me, don't pray for them anymore. So now he's saying, Lord, let me remind you about me. <laughs> no, because I don't want to get caught up in all this right here that's going on. So let me remind you about me. We find ourselves doing that sometimes, you know. You know, we, 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 get, we get like, Lord, you know what? <laughs> so uh, anyway... So uh, this is, this, like I said, he had the, the uh, letters. He had those letters that he did. So Jeremiah chapter 29, 
is a long prose passage consisting of letters. Uh, hold that and I'll tell you when to read it. <laughs> I should have gave it to you when I can't mention it. <laughs> so Jeremiah 29 is a long prose passage consisting of letters between Jeremiah, uh, what, between Jerusalem and Babylon. So it's a, the letter was going from Jerusalem to Babylon. There are at least four letters in this passage. There was one from Jeremiah to the exiles, and that's verses one, uh, one through 15, and then verses 21 through 23. That's from Jeremiah to the exiles. Then you have from Shemaiah to Babylon to Zephaniah. That's verses 25 through 28. Then you had a letter from Jeremiah, and he wrote to Shemaiah, uh, and that's going to be verse number 24. And then you have from Jeremiah to the exiles. That's verses 31 through 32. Now, the letter that went from, from Shemaiah to Zephaniah, you know, Jeremiah really didn't know everything that was in there. So he responded to Shemaiah, but we don't know everything that he told him. So that's why it's going to say, thus says the Lord. So he was speaking on God's behalf, and then it went to the other letter because we didn't know what he said because, you know, that's still over in the Dead Sea Cave somewhere. It's still a scroll. They hadn't, they hadn't found that yet. Uh, they're still es excavating. Is that how you say that word? Excavating? They're still doing that so that they could find, you know, the letters. That's one that, that they haven't found. So they don't know what, what was said in that letter right there. That's why, like I said, verse 24, I think it just said, thus says the Lord. Uh, and then it goes into one of the others. It goes into verse 25. So it go from that one thing, and then they can't tell you what it is, so it went straight to verse 25 and told you what Shemaiah said and stuff. So the exact dates of the letters are unknown, but it's believed that they were written in the days following the downfall of Judah in 597 B.C., a period of unrest, you know, because there was a lot of fighting going on. There was a lot of, you know, all that stuff that they was going on. They were fighting, basically. So a period of unrest was all over the Babylonian Empire, and prophets both in Jerusalem and in Babylon were proclaiming the intimate ending of the exile, believing that Babylon was about to collapse because there was just so much going on. There was fighting everywhere. So everybody, everybody was involved. You know, and then, like I said, you had the famine going on. So on top of all that, then you had the pestilence. You had all this stuff going on. There was a lot going on during this time period. So note that in verse number one, the letter reads, to the remaining elders among the exile. That's what that letter says in verse number one, to the remaining elders among the exile. So now this indicates that some of the elders had died or they were executed or they were imprisoned because of troubles or disturbances. So you know those elders were people that were in the high positions too. Verse number two interrupts the flow uh, uh, between verses one and verse number three. It referred to the court officials, the leaders of Jeru Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths leaving Jerusalem. So if you look at verse number one, it tells you about these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders. And then it ends, the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then you go to verse number two. <laughs> verse number two says, this was after King Jekiah, the queen mother, court official leaves and all that. Then it says, number three, the letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, son of Shephon and Gemariah, Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it said, thus says the Lord of hosts and all that. So, Verse number, wait a minute. Verse number two says, this was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the articians and Smith had departed from Jerusalem. Then it goes back down. You see where it goes. They're talking about the letter in verse number one. Number two is telling you about a king and all the, the officials leaving, talking about them leaving, escaping. Then it go down and talk about the letter again. So that's what they're talking about. It's like there was a break in there, like two were just thrown up in there because they're talking about the letter. So, and uh, uh, talking about this letter that, that Jeremiah's writing. 
So that's 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 simply what that means. And then uh, verse number three tells us that Jeremiah's initial letter was sent by hand to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. That's verse number three. The letter was delivered by Eleazar, son of Shephan, and Gamariah, son of Hilkiah. They were of priestly descent. Therefore, they played a key role in Josiah's reform. Remember Josiah's reform. He came, he found the scroll, his, uh, his, uh, uh, one, of his, one of his servants, of course, found the scroll because they was in there cleaning the temple and all that kind of stuff. And he found the scroll and he brought it to him. And Josiah read it, and then he, when, it, when, it, when the servant found it, he read it. He ran to Josiah to show him because they were not living right. And, you know, the scroll, of course, at this time were, you know, the uh, Pentateuch, you know. So he found some of that. He found the Pentateuch because that's what was kept in that temple at that time. And so he ran, and he's looking at all these commandments and rules that they were supposed to be living by. And he knew, you know, the, they were not living by these rules. They were not keeping, they weren't doing the feast. They wasn't doing, you know, they wasn't keeping none. They wasn't doing the Ten Commandments. They wasn't Ten Commandments. They wasn't doing Leviticus. They wasn't doing none of this. They wasn't keeping any of the rules. They were sinning. So when he saw it, he ran to Josiah. And when he showed it to Josiah, remember, Josiah tore his robe, tore his clothes and all that. And he was the king, but he tore his, out, his clothes and stuff because he knew that, you know, we are not living according to how God wants us to live, you know. So he knew he had to do something, do something about that. So that's where the Reformation come in at. So that's what he did. So um, he... he uh, but he stopped them from worshiping at the high places, cause they were, they were. This is when they were going to Dan and Bethel, and uh, and then even in Jerusalem they had some high places. So he told, had them to destroy the high places. God had been told them years and years earlier to destroy the high places. Remember, way back when God had told them to do that, many kings before, and they did. So now he comes along, and when he saw that scroll. He immediately started telling them, tear down the high places, get rid of those idols. Because remember, they were, they, were, they were worshiping the idols, and they were worshiping God. That's what they were doing. And God was like, no, 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 you can't be doing this. And that's what they were doing. So he got rid of all of that. He did a whole reformation and said, we're going to live by what this here uh, scroll is telling us. We're going to do this. And of course, just like we have the Bible, and we can say we're going to live by this Bible, we still got hard-headed people, <laughs> stiff-necked people. <laughs> that are going to live the way that they want to live. So it's the same. So, uh, but so these guys were in priesthood. They, they, so when uh, they, they, uh, they were, these guys were pre, they were true priests and they were friendly toward uh, Jeremiah. Because remember, people were treating Jeremiah mean at this time. They were very mean to him. Remember, even his family, people were wanting to kill him. So they were real mean to him. But even, <laughs> even when they see that we're being taken into exile, they done marched us all across the desert and stuff, you know. They done took out, you know, just took, sent us from our homeland and left it desolate, you know. And we, they still, you know, you had some people. Now, these people were friendly toward him, but some people just did not like him. So their mission to Nebuchadnezzar was more important than simply to carry the annual tribute. And y'all know the tribute is when they be paying, you know, paying that money so that to those kings, like they were paying, like Israel was paying to Assyria, you know, they were also paying to Babylon. They were paying to Israel. Please don't fight us. Don't jump on us. Don't beat us up. Leave us alone, and we're just going to pay y'all. <laughs> you know, don't bully us. us. We're just going to pay y'all, and that's what they were doing. So uh, they may have been sent to assure Nebuchadnezzar of Zedekiah's loyalty after their failed attempt to plan a revolt among the small states. And you can read about that over in Jeremiah chapter 27. I mean, they would, they would go and they would know how they were doing, conquering all the small states and then taking over. And Assyria was real bad about that. That's how they built their vast, their was paying tribute to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. And they still turned against them because they still took them into exile. Remember, they, was even paying, they were paying tribute to Egypt at one time. You know, help us fight anybody that come along, you know, keep our enemies from us and all that. And then when they got into this big fight, Egypt just, okay. You know, and then remember, they even got slick. They were trying to pay, they were paying Egypt and Assyria. Remember, they was even paying two of them. And then the, Assyria and Egypt didn't get along. It was like, why are you paying them? Why are you paying them? So then when they got in trouble, both of them turned their backs on, you know. So they were doing all that kind of stuff like that. So um, it is evident that there was a good deal of communication between them. So they were. There were a lot of talking going on because Nebuchadnezzar Babylon, you know, he was greedy. He wanted to get paid. 
you know, just get my money. I don't care, you know, just get my money. We're going to come and get y'all. Well, now you're taking them in exile anyway. They were paying them. And he still, you know, he still did that because he was, he was, he was busy. He was just like the guy over there. Now, you know, remember, Babylon took Assyria, and they, cap they captured Assyria and, and uh, you know, destroyed them. So they had gotten big now. They had gotten big-headed now. So they didn't care. Now, uh, and, you know, Assyria was way, like, bigger than Judah, but still, it's like they were paying them tribute. So right now, we're not going to get y'all. We're going to go over here and get Assyria because they just got a lot of captives over here. They got a lot of, you know, they got a lot of folks. So we're going to go over here, and we're going to beat them. And that's what they did. They, they were beating, you know, the nations and stuff. So uh, in verse number four, the claim is again made that it was God who deported the exiles, using as his servant, using them as his servant, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a pagan king. Now, we discussed this over in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse number nine, where God would bring all the tribes of the north against Judah and its citizens, as well as against the nations around them. So remember, he, they didn't just capture Judah. They took all those other nations that were around them because they got to them first before they got to Judah. So why bypass them? We might as well take them captive too. <laughs> so that's what they did. So in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9, God referred to Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. Remember, he called him his servant. And remember, the Israelites got mad, or the Judeans, they got mad. Like, he's a pagan king. Why are you calling him your servant? You know, that should be us. You know, we're your servant. Why are you calling that pagan king your servant? Your, your, your servant. They talking about, you know, going at war against us. Why are you calling them your, him your servant? This stuff. Mind you, Jeremiah had already told them that God was going to use him to come and take them. You know, he, they, the people still were stiff-necked and hard-headed. Oh, no, we're his people. We're the Israelites. He wouldn't dare do that against us. He wouldn't dare use a pagan king you know, to come against us and take, let us go into exile for him. Really, who else you gonna go into exile for? Israel's gone, you know, your allies, they gone, you know, your sister folks, they gone, you know, they already gone into exile. And it was 10 tribes, you know, y'all only two. So what make you think that they wouldn't, they, they got arrogant, they got prideful. So there is no evidence that the king of Babylon was ever a worshiper of God, but God called him my servant. But, but there's no evidence that Nebuchadnezzar was, you know, his, uh, a worshiper. The word servant here has another meaning. Nebuchadnezzar was God's instrument or his vessel of judgment on Judah. So Nebuchadnezzar was summoned along with the tribes of the north to destroy Judah and its inhabitants for their rebellion against God. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, all the way through 45, verse 1, God referred to Cyrus, the king of Persia, as my shepherd. He called him his shepherd, and he also called him his anointed. So even the king, and, and even uh, Cyrus, I remember Cyrus is going to be the king over Persia when he overtakes Babylon. So at that time, so God used, <laughs> so God used uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to overtake his people, Judah, then he turned around and he used Persia, King Cyrus, to take over Babylon. And then it's going to be, of course, the Persian King Cyrus that's going to let the Israelites go after 70 years. <laughs> so in verses 5 and 6, the advice given by Jeremiah, which is again in the letter, this is the whole thing is the letter, so he's giving advice now. So the advice given by Jeremiah was revolutionary and contrary to that being given by the prophets in Babylon. So his advice is different. The verbs he used, build and plant, went back to, remember when Jeremiah was called in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, you know, they used the words uh, build and plant. Remember the almond, they did the almond tree and all that kind of stuff, and he was planting that and building things. So, but the, 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 the meaning of them is a little different. The people, too, right now he's telling them, Jeremiah's telling them, you know, this is his advice to them. Settle down. Y'all been to be here for a minute. So you might as well settle down. And remember them folks were telling them, y'all ain't going to be there for two years. Y'all just going to be there two years. So they thought they were going to be in there and out of there. I'm like, okay, so really? Two years? They just going to capture y'all and... 
yeah, for two years, 24 months, they gonna let y'all go. These people, that y'all have seen them, they've seen them do war. They've seen them beat people. They've seen them take people captive. And it's like, they didn't sit there and think, well, they didn't let them go in two years, <laughs> you know? But remember, they were arrogant. They were prideful. God's not gonna leave us over there. You know, even though we don't listen to him and we blame him for all this sin that we doing and we don't, you know, we worshiping other gods, we still his people. He still loves us. You know, he loved our ancestors, Abraham, you know, Isaac, Jacob, David. All, he loved all, he, all, he said there will always be one of us on the throne. Because remember, these are David folks now. So, they, 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 I mean, and it was like, so they just knew, okay, they're going to listen to these false prophets. They told them two years, instead of Jeremiah, then they told them, no, it's going to be a long time. So now he's telling them, settle down. Y'all might as well settle down. Y'all might as well build up and plant. <laughs> build you a house and plant you a garden <laughs> because y'all finna be over there for a minute. So, <laughs> and, and, and like I said, they were obviously, they were free to do, move around and do things. And, and you will see that in Ezekiel. He's going to explain all that, how they're able to walk around, do stuff, you know, I guess as long as they didn't cross the border, they were fine. They were able to move around and do stuff. So that's why Jeremiah was telling them, take advantage of it. You know, don't sit around and mope and grope and don't have anything because God is going to rescue us, but we're going to be there for a minute. So some of us going to be gone, going to be dead and gone, but we got kids. We, gonna have, we got generations behind us. We need to build for them. So when we leave here, just like when the Israelites left, uh, when the Israelites were left Egypt, Remember, they went around and they got all this gold and all this kind of stuff. The people gave them a lot. So Jeremiah said, you don't want to leave empty-handed. So get out there. We, we may not get any gold and silver and all that, but uh, you need to be planting. You can make some money. You know, you can sell some of those products. So he's trying to tell them for their good. Get out there and do something. So they had their own organization with elders. As you see that, and this is over in Ezekiel. Talk, this is Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1, and then chapter 14, verse 1. Well, they got organized. You know, when they went, they got organized. And this is what Jeremiah is telling them. We need to be organized. Y'all need to be doing this. Y'all need to be settled. Ezekiel and other prophets could minister to them. So they were able to, to, to teach them the word. They were able to talk to them, tell them what thus says the Lord. They had certain tasks to perform for the state, but otherwise they could lead a normal life. So long as they were obedient to, to the state of Babylon, just do what y'all are supposed to do, then we're going to set y'all up. But y'all know this is God because God used him. So this is just God in his mind telling you, no, this is God's way. God is still taking care of his people, even though they're hard-headed. So if they didn't plant them a garden and build them a house and, and, and do all the things, then that's them living in the woods and living in the rain. And, and, and all that, what you got to eat. That's them doing all that. So if, 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 if you, <laughs> so, yep. So they had certain things they were supposed to do. And if they did everything right, then they could develop themselves again and be that great nation that they were supposed to be. All they had to do was just do what was right. So farming, marrying, giving in marriage were to be part of their daily living. They were supposed to just continue on with life. You know, God was still providing. Like I said, he was providing them with the means. He was providing them with everything. They were supposed to continue on in marriage because they were still supposed to be having kids, still having babies, multiply, you know. So they were still supposed to be multiplying, increasing, and going on with, with what God told them to do. So it was very different from the words of the prophets. This was very different. Jeremiah's letter, Jeremiah's words were different from the prophets who declared that the exile would be over in two years. <laughs> they were allowed to worship God. They were allowed to worship God then, even though they were out of their promised land without a temple and sacrifices. They were still allowed to worship God because, like I said, Ezekiel, we'll see a little bit more of it because it said Ezekiel and other prophets still ministered to them. So they were still being able to be preached to and to be preached about uh, God and his word. So all that didn't stop. They didn't make them go out and say, the only thing you can do is worship this idol. So they didn't do that. They allowed them the freedom to worship God. Now, you know some of them crazy folks still worship them idols, right? Right. They did. They didn't stop. <laughs> you know, right. They did not stop. Just like they were doing it 
in the promised land and their own land, they were still doing it over here. And these people were not making them do it. You know, in the promised land, they had kings sometimes that were making them do it. Well, over here, they were. And these were their own kings because they got hooked up with the wrong person because you think about Ahab and, uh, and Jezebel. You know, so you had kings like that, and they were making them, you know, do it. But here, they had the choice. And some of them still choose to, chose to worship the idols. So even though the, uh, the advice from Jeremiah was practical, it could lead to some resentment among those who had been carried off from their homeland by those for whom Jeremiah was asking them to pray for. Because Jeremiah is still telling them, even telling them, pray for, pray for our enemies, basically. Pray for these folks over here. Pray for us, but pray for these folks. Pray for these Babylonians, you know. So that's what Jeremiah is telling them. Pray for, pray for these folks, you know, and do what we're supposed to do. Do what God is telling us to do. He keeps saying, thus says the Lord, we are to build. We are to plant. We are to, you know, have service. We are to still worship him, you know, even though we're over here. <laughs> Recognize the fact that this is our fault that we are over here. This is not God's fault. Some of these people were still blaming God, and that's why... They were still, they were resentful. That's why they were resentful, even though Jeremiah was telling them just simple stuff that they could have been doing while they were at home, and they didn't. So now they're still, like they're at home, blaming God. They're resentful because they're now in captivity. So verses 8 and 9 discuss how the false prophets had told the people that their stay would be short, two years, and that Jeremiah needed to assure the people that this was not so. So this, this is what verse 8 and 9 talk about. The, the, uh, the prophets that are telling these people they were going to be short, but Jeremiah is saying, no, it's not going to be like that, and that it was a lie propagated in the name of God who had not sent them. So remember, these, prop, these, these prophets are false prophets that God hadn't sent, but they were saying, I come in the name of the Lord God who said, y'all ain't going to be over there but two years. <laughs> you know, y'all don't have to build houses. Y'all don't have to plant a garden. Y'all don't have to do any of that because we're going to be delivered. He's going to come back, and we're going to go back over there within these two years. He's going to let us go. It's like they were saying God was holding them hostage. You know, he's going to let us go in, the, in that time, in two years. So these prophets were associated, were associates. They were associates of diviners and dreamers. Divine, remember, we talked about that in class, about the difference in a vision and a dream. Was that Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have to recognize whether it's a dream or a vision. You know, you have to know that. So these people associated with diviners and dreamers, it became clear that at least some of these leaders were working for revolt, which could only bring disaster. So they they were trying to they were trying to start a revolution. They were trying to start a revolt with these people, with their people. They didn't want them to be obedient to what God is saying. It was an attempt to speed up the divine purposes. They ready to go back home. So even though he done told us two years, maybe we can get this done by, we, we know, we telling these folks this kind of stuff, maybe we can get it done in a year. So they trying to start a revolt. And these are the, the folks in high position talking to the people, you know. So that's what they, they ready to just, <laughs> but God would not be Herod in his plans for his people. They, they forgot that God was in control. God, and that's what we do now. We forget that God is in control. No matter what is going on, no matter how bad it is, God is in control. We don't know why stuff happens. You know, we don't even understand sometimes why stuff happens. But God is in control. He knows. He knows stuff we don't know. You know what I'm saying? He knows. Y'all, generational curse is for real. Generational curses are for real. We don't know what great uncle, granddad is so-and-so did that could have caused this curse and nobody changed it. And that's why, you know, you can have all the folks in your family that don't go to church, don't read the Bible, don't do anything. Generation, generation, generation. But you can change it by picking up your Bible and starting your kids and going to church. So we don't know what so-and-so did, what they did. But these people were trying to hurry up God's plan. So the false prophets <laughs> tried to persuade the people that they would not experience sword and famine, but they would enjoy enduring peace and our lasting prosperity. Remember that? But it was typical of the prophets who opposed Jeremiah to paint this type of picture for the future. The facts, however, were otherwise. The prophets showed a profound misunderstanding of the covenant. 
if they continue to engage in, quote, unquote, the lie, because that's what Jeremiah referred it to, the lie, you know, that they were feeding to the people. So now, remember, they started this way over there while they were still, before they got captured, before they went into exile, they were telling these people this. Now they done brought it over here to Babylon, still telling them the same lie. How these people believe it, I don't know. Because of the fact that Jeremiah is telling them one thing, these people were telling them, remember they started out telling them, Jeremiah is just making it up. He's not going to, we're not going to go into captivity. So it started from all the way back then to, oh, now you're in captivity, now what? Jeremiah just, you know, you're in captivity. Oh, it's just going to be two years. You know, he's saying it's a long time. It's not going to be no long time. It's just going to be two years, you know. So y'all done went from saying, we're not going to be captive. He's just talking, you know, don't listen to him. We're not going to change. We're not going to repent to actually getting captured to now, you know. So they still, it, right there in their eyes, it's happening to them. Physically, it's happening to them. You done lost folks. You know, because that was a long journey, number one. But you have lost people. People have died right there at your feet. Y'all left folks dead on the ground because there was nobody to bury them. You know, and you all are Israelites, and you all believe in burial, so this is a big curse to you all. Y'all have just, what, de deconsecrated your land. Or consecrated. Y'all have defeminated. Y'all have messed up the land. <laughs> <laughs> What's that D word? Y'all the D, 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 huh? Well, they did destruction too, but decom, D, D something. Y'all the decontaminated. I'd, be, I'd say that one. Y'all done deconsecrate the land. Deconsecrated. Is that a word? Defiled. Deconsecrated? Defiled. Yeah, defiled. We'll use that little bit of short word. <laughs> they they done defiled the land. Can we make a defamation? <laughs> Give me a big word in there. <laughs> but they have messed up the land. But they still was like, it's just going to be two years. You know, you sitting in captivity, Holly. Don't do anything. It's going to be two years. You know, don't plant. Don't make a house. Don't plant, you know, your garden. Don't do anything. You know, it ain't going to be for two years. So they, they were the ones that didn't do anything. Now, they were officials and stuff like that. So, because some of these officials got caught too. So um, they, uh, uh, instead of enduring, like I said, peace, instead of enduring the peace and lasting prosperity, there would be divine judgment for those folks because they were still lying to the people. To God's people. Remember, these are still God's people. God spoke regarding these prophets. So God said something. They had preached in his name, but what they preached was a lie, a fraudulent vision, a worthless divination, the deceitful invention of their own heart, because they wanted these people to follow them. And they did. That's how, like, the false, those false prophets prosperity things that people out here doing now, you know, giving you that false hope and stuff, and you take your little money, what you have, and, and invest it and give it to them, and you know good and well you ain't got Jesus' blood in that little bio that they send you, you know. If you do not have Jesus' blood, you do not have the sweat of Jesus in this little bio that they send you, but that's what they do. And people, you know, you got trillions of people in this world. People are going through so much, people are deaf, they, you know, everybody's different. You don't know what somebody's going through. And, and, and you know, and, and everybody's situation, just because you have a situation, that their situation could be worse and then theirs could be worse. I mean, it's bad, bad situations going on. So people's mindsets are not the same. So that's how, you know, you sit back and say, how do somebody believe that that's Jesus' blood in that bio? Because of the fact that what they have been through, how, you know, what, how they live and what they're doing, they could be like that, for real. You know, and stuff. I, I, I met a lady that, you know, thinks that she's, her husband was in prison, told her that she, she's going to have a baby and it's going to be through divine conception. He was in there for life, but he didn't want her to, to get a divorce or to marry somebody else. So he told her that. So she walking around, wouldn't give it to anybody because she didn't want to mess up her divine conception that was going to happen. And she truly believed this. This, this woman truly believed this. She wasn't mental, <laughs> so that's not it. She was not a mental patient. She was not mental. She truly believed. That's why I say you never know somebody's mindset because people can play these mind games like what these people were doing. And because she loved her husband, she believed her husband who was in there for murder, but she loved her husband. So whatever he told her, you know, by the end, he had, you know, he had her in anybody, you know, 
they can hypnotize you. People can still hypnotize. They can do all that stuff, you know. But he had her, and she truly believed that this lady went to work every day and all that. There was nothing, you know. But she believed it truly in her heart, you know, just like we're supposed to believe in, in, in God, with our, with, you know, with our heart, not just with our mind. So with her heart, she believed her husband. That kind of love. She had that agape love, you know, for him. She truly loved her husband and believed him. So everybody's different. So these people, you know, are truly believe that that's Jesus' blood in there. Just like these people here are believing exactly what these prophets, some of these people are believing exactly what these, these, these false prophets are saying. Two years. So you had a lot of people that did just what they did. They didn't prepare. So the divine purpose for Israel is stated in verse number 10. The divine purpose is in verse number 10. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So for 70 years, we see it right there. For 70 years, God told them, y'all not going to see me. Y'all not going to hear from me. I'm going to be totally silent. For 70 years while they were in exile. So he still made a way for them, though. He told them, build a house. Plant your garden. Now, if you did that, <laughs> you were going to be taken care of, even though you was over here in Babylon. He still made a way. Even though they was in, you know, dire you know, conditions, he still made a way so that they didn't, they, they could do, they could do good. Because some of them prospered. Some of them prospered. So much so that when Persia came and took them and they was taken to Persia, they did the same thing. And guess what? Some of them didn't even want to go back to the promised land because they were doing so good over there. Think about Esther, Mordecai. They stayed. They didn't go back. So God still provided because they were his people. He did not... You know, he, he, he completely left them, though. Like he said, I'm I'm, y'all don't want me, so guess what? So 70 years, for these years, y'all missed doing my Sabbath. During the years y'all missed doing my Sabbath. That's what I'm going to do to y'all. Y'all ignored me for all this time, even though they ignored him for a lot longer, 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 you know, for years and years, a lot longer. He, he only did them for 70 years, just for the Sabbath. So it is remarkable that Jeremiah was able to propose that the power of Babylon would not last for very long. So 70 years in verse number 10 is significant. Those 70 years are significant. Originally, it may have meant just a normal lifespan. You know, somebody can live, you can live 70, 80, 90 years and stuff like that. But it is used in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse number 11, for a long but definite period. So we, we, we read about it back then, 29, 25, verse 11. And it was also used for post-exilic times in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse number 21. You'll see the word 70 again. And also in Daniel chapter 9, verse number 2. And then in Ezra chapter 1, verse number 1. So the number 70 was important. And then in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12, it denotes the interval between the destruction of the temple in 587 B.C. and its rebuilding in 520 uh, or 515 B.C. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 20 through 23, it is the period between 587 B.C. and Cyrus's edict of 538 B.C. So there we have Cyrus right there. And then in Daniel chapter 9, it is used as a basis for demonstration that in the days of this guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, the purpose of God would be fulfilled. So as he said, told, told them whatever they were going through in 70 years, it's going to be over with. So 70 was an important number. But the fall from of Nineveh in 612 B.C. to the fall of Babylon in 539 B.C., there was only 73 years. There were 73 years. And then uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the fall, when, when he rose up and then fell from Nebuchadnezzar 605 B.C., to the fall of Babylon, there was only 63 years. So there was a couple of years that were like close to it, but not right there. So in verses 11 through 13, God's thoughts for his people were fixed. It says they were for their welfare, not their hurt, and for the future they hoped for. This is that 29. We hear people uh, quoting Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 all the time. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 
I know the plans I have for you. you <laughs> for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, y'all, see, he's talking to these Israelites, right? He's talking to these Israelites because of the stuff that they had, the way that they treated him. So God is saying, I know what I got planned for you all. Y'all listen to all these false prophets out here. Y'all doing things y'all want to do. Y'all doing all this crazy stuff. But I know what I got planned for y'all. And right now, I'm going to leave y'all for 70 years out here on your own <laughs> because you hard-headed, because you stiff-necked, because you won't listen to me. So when you come back, and if you come back, but, but, but in the meantime, like he said, I'm going to look out for your welfare. Because these folks going to let y'all build houses on some land. And they're going to let you grow, grow a garden, grow stuff on your land. Now, y'all got talents. Artisan, Smith, you know, they had talents. God blessed them with talents. So you can do more than just, you know, plant your garden. You can also work. So even though they did him like that, he still provided for them, just like he provides for us today. And then he gave them protection. He protected them while they were there. He protected them. He didn't have to do that after the way they did him, but he still gave them his protection. And then he healed them because all that famine and pe all that pestilence, all them plagues and all that, they left all that over in Judah. So now here you are. You got them over there. They strong enough to build houses and, 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 and plant gardens and all that and work. So he was taking care of them. God was still, like, he, he was still taking care of them even after all that they had did. So they, they and the, the verse says, they were for their welfare, not their hurt, and for the future that they hoped for. So he was still looking out for them. <coughs> the privilege of the people in that future would be to continue their relationship with God. That's all he want. That's what he want with us. All he wants to do is continue to have a good relationship with him. And, and, and we just have to, you know, we have to communicate with, with God. We have to communicate with God. We have to have that relationship with him. And that's all he wanted. So all they had to do for their future, to have that future that they dreamed to hope for, have that relationship. It seems that when Jeremiah wrote this letter, there was resentment against God and a loss of confidence because it was only when they came to him and prayed and sought for him with their whole hearts that he could be found. So that's what we have to do. We have to be sincere. We don't have just have to, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you and da da, da. We don't need to just be going around just throwing that out there, just to be throwing it out there like we hear so many people do. Oh, God know what plans. Something falls through. Oh, God know what plans he got for me. Oh, God know. He told you don't do this right here that you just did. So now all of a sudden he know the plans. Didn't he know them plans back then? You know, so now all of a sudden, he, and then you still go out there and do something else that he didn't tell you to do, but then you go back and quote that, well, he know, he, he know my heart and he know my plans, so uh, he, he looking out for me, you know, and stuff like that. So and you can see that over in Amos chapter 5, verses 4 and 6, Hosea chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. So Amos 5, chapter, four, uh, chapter 5, verses 4 and 6 reads, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, and do not enter Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall, go, shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour, devour Bethel, which no one... <laughs> God could not dispense the blessings of the covenant to rebellious people. So now here we see, really and truly... Everybody's always quoting Jeremiah 29, 11, when you got Amos chapter uh, 5, verses 4 through 6 saying the same thing. They just don't, don't, you know, they just don't quote that all the time. And it's saying, it's really telling you to seek him, and then whatever, you can seek him and you're going to live. You know, seek him and he's going to do everything. To live means that he's going to do everything for you. All you got to do is seek him first. Seek him first, you know. And so God will not, like I said, dispense. He's not going to bless you. If you out there just doing all this other stuff that they doing, that's what he's saying. He's not going to dispense his blessing of the covenant to rebellious people. Obedience, loyalty, and fellowship were fundamental. There could be hope for the people if they had all that. And, and then at verse number 13, the blessings of the covenant would, be, uh, would become available. That's what verse number 13 is saying. We will have that covenant again because we're in exile. We can have that covenant with him again. 
That thing ain't tell me. I don't want to go over y'all town. Oh, wait, let me hurry up. I'm going over y'all town. I'm going over y'all town. I'm not there yet. <laughs> uh, fortunes will be restored. So they were going to get their, their, their stuff back. The exiles will be gathered from the nations and lands where they were scattered. The, the exiles would be gathered from the nations and lands where they were scattered and restored to their homeland, to the place from which they had been deported. Because some of them ran. Some of them got away. So they scattered all over the place, but they not over in uh, Judah. And of course, they're not in Israel. So they just scattered all over the place. Their land was the land promised to their forefathers. For, to their forefathers. The condition of their occupancy of the land was obedience. So in order to get that land back, they were going to have to be obedient. So this was nothing automatic and nothing permanent for those uh, who rejected God and his covenant. Uh, these are the ones I was just talking about. Uh, verse 15 begins a natural development of an argument. It says, in verse, and then in verse 16, the discussion returns to the people in Judah who had not been exiled to Babylon. So these people have not been exiled to Babylon. God had a word for them as well as uh, Zedekiah, the king of David's land at that time. So Zedekiah had been the king. Although they escaped the judgment of 597 B.C., they still stood under judgment, and their fate had yet to manifest. So they were still going to be under judgment. They just got with these are the ones that, you know, like remember when Israel uh, and, and, and the Assyrians took Israel and some of them folks ran into the cave and they got away like that? So these, though, these are those people that happened in Judah. They managed to run and hide and go to caves and all that. So they managed to get away. They were hiding. But they couldn't really stay in Judah because, remember, Judah became desolate. And the wild animals was all around and, and killing anybody and all that because they were hungry too. You know, so the, these were those people right there. These were just like those. They were the ones that got away. So although they escaped the judgment, you know, they, they were going to still be on the judgment. They, they got away from that. They exiled, but they were still going to be on the judgment because some of these folks were hard-headed too. And they didn't listen to God. The people who remained after 597 B.C. might have taken heed of what God had spoken through his servant and mended their ways. So they may have changed. But some of them, you know, however, they did not. Despite the urgency and persistence that God spoke to them, so for them too, judgment would come. So some of those folks did not repent. Some of them folks stayed the same way they were. So they were going to get judgment. They, 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 they managed to get out of the exile because they ran ahead but they were still going to be judged. So they still didn't get away with it. So we don't get away with stuff just because we didn't get caught. <laughs> you know, it could come at you in a different way. You be thinking you got away, but then you're wondering why, you know, this over here happening. You know, you didn't get away with it. You're saying that every day. Every day. Every day. God sees everything. He knows our thoughts. So you don't get away. You don't even get away with thinking it. You know, God knows. I don't know why we think he don't. He can't, you know, read our thoughts. He don't know our minds. In verse number 20, the attention is switched back to the exiles. It appears that verse 20 is picking up where the, where, uh, the thread was temporarily dropped at verse number 15. So it's like it went from 15 to 20, and they had some stuff in between there. So verse number 15 says, Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. And then verse number 20 says, but now all you exiles whom I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon, hear the word of the Lord. So see, it's like it picked right back up with that. So this leads back to the main arguments of Jeremiah's letter. The identity of the prophets whom God had raised up in Babylon was now going to be told. Because he was then getting to it, then he stopped and started talking about something else, and then he, now he got back to it. So it's like, man, you know, it's just like a soap opera or something. You know, why you went to the commercial? Maybe he went to the commercial in the middle of a good picture or something. But, you know, so it's like now you're getting back to it. So Ahab, the son of Kaliah, and Zedekiah, son of uh, Masa, Ma Masiah, not Messiah, but Masiah, were two of many false, they were, they were false prophets among the people in Babylon. That's why Jer Jer uh, Jeremiah ended up writing to in Babylon. They were still prophesying in God's name. And they also lived evil lives. They committed adultery with the wives of their friends or their neighbors and committed a scandal. You can read about that scandal in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 9 through 15. Is that what I gave you to read? Is that chapter 23, verses 9 through 15? Mm -hmm. Read that. Read some of that. Concerning the prophets, my heart These are concerning the prophets now. My heart is crushed within me. All my bones shake. I have become like a drunkard, like one overcome by wine. Because of the Lord and because of his holy word. For the land is full of adulterers because of the curse the land mourns. 
and the pastors of the wilderness are dried up. Their course has been evil, and their might is not right. Both prophets and priests are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their wickedness, says the Lord. Therefore, their way shall be to them like slippery path in the darkness, into which they shall be driven and fall. For I will bring this act upon them in the year of their punishment, says the Lord. Okay, y'all got it. That's what them prophets, there was, there was, some of those were God's prophets. Some of those were prophets that were in his house, as he said. These were prophets that had went bad. So they were, they were, you know, pagan guys, and then you had his guys. So for these offenses, they were handed. So these false, for, the, for these guys, these two guys they're talking about, and for some of these other prophets, they were false prophets. But anyway, because of all this evil stuff they were doing, and because they was also, you know, doing, doing all this, they were handed over to Nebuchadnezzar for punishment. Nebuchadnezzar would not have punished them just for them offenses because he was a pagan king too. They worshiped idols. They worshiped gods. He was out there doing all this stuff they were doing. There was something else. They seemed to have been involved in some political offenses, such as encouraging the people to revolt, you know, because they wanted to be in charge. Remember how it was in Israel. You kill this king, you can be king. So they probably thought, if I can kill Nebuchadnezzar, then I could be king. So Nebuchadnezzar had them executed by roasting in the fire, which was a punishment that was used in Babylon over a long period of time. Daniel chapter 3, verse 6 reads, Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. So that's what they did. If you didn't worship them, you know, certain people, then they're going to burn you up, throw you in the fire alive. You will not be dead. Then you will be alive when they throw you up in there. This was how someone could discern the false prophets. Any prophet was false who turned Israel away from her complete loyalty to God. So they turned Israel, you know that they, they were false, and they was up there, you know, just talking. The true prophet would know that his task was to encourage the nation to maintain total loyalty to God and to set before them the obligations of the covenant, which was what Josiah was trying to do. So Jerusalem prophets also committed adultery, and they followed the lie. So now all his folks, his prophets and his priests, in their own lives, they rejected the sole and complete sovereignty of God. Remember, they were blaming God for everything. They stopped believing in him. They gave encouragement to evildoers, but they also, I'm almost finished, continued in their evil ways. They were all like Sodom and Jerusalem citizens were like Gomorrah. So the false prophets were distinguished both by their false preaching and by their evil way of life. So they were, they were, they were living all kind of funny ways. Jeremiah's letter evoked some repercussions. So he did get, you know, faulted for some of this. In verses 24 through 25, Shemaiah, the Nehemite, another false prophet, wrote a complaint to the temple overseer. So now he didn't saw this letter, and now he complaining. Details of Jeremiah's reply is not given. So we don't know what Jeremiah said, but only his summary of Shemaiah's letter of complaint, which was 25 through 28. Shemaiah and his place of origin, Nehemiah, is not known. They don't know where this guy came from. They don't know about his country. None of that. Uh, you know, because I guess it was destroyed later on. They didn't have any information. Jeremiah charged him with sending a letter in his own name. Remember, she read that. He wrote the letter in his own name. He wrote it to Zephaniah, who was the son of Messiah, Messiah, the priest, who was also the overseer in the temple in Jerusalem. It is not clear why it was an offense to write in his own name unless Jeremiah was expressing the view that the letter did not have God's authority because he did not write it in the name of God. Because remember, you have to have God's authority. And some of them folks did not. Some of them, especially none of them false prophets had his authority because they never prayed they, to him and they never read the scroll. They never read the Bible, but the scroll, of course. They never did all that. They didn't follow the covenant. So they were not under God's authority. This charge is repeated also. you see it again. She read it again, in fact, in verse number 31. But then in verse number 31, it had a conclusion with it. 32 was a conclusion. This one don't have a conclusion. So in verses 26 through 29, the contents of Shemaiah's letters are summarized. Tell you what Shemaiah said. But Zedekiah was not the priest overseer in the temple in the, palace, in the place of, uh, he, he, he wasn't the overseer. So one of the duties of the overseer was to lay hold of a, ma of a madman and self-styled prophets and lock them up. Despite all that had happened, in confirmation of Jeremiah's earlier preaching, he still was regarded as mad. Remember, they still thought Jeremiah was mad. No matter all this stuff that they see going on, them taking in the exile, them going on long two years, no matter all this, 
They still said Jeremiah was mad. He was crazy. Zephaniah consulted Jeremiah twice on Zedekiah's behalf, and you'll see that in Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 1, and then also Jeremiah chapter 37, verse 3. He is described as second priest. So he's the second priest in charge, Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 24. So he was finally taken prisoner in 587 B.C. after the fall of Jerusalem, and he was executed. But the, that's that king right there. The concern of Shemaiah was that Zephaniah had not fulfilled his duty by leaving Jeremiah free. Because Jeremiah doing all this talking, and you still ain't arrested him. His specific complaint was that Jeremiah had said that the exiles would be in Babylon for a long time and that they should build the houses, settle down, plant gardens, and all that stuff. So unfortunately, the rest of Jeremiah's letter to Shemaiah has not been transmitted. We don't have that. So all we have is that Zephaniah read the letter to Jeremiah, and we see that at verse number 29. So whether he was sympathetic or he intended to warn Jeremiah is not clear because we don't have that. In any case, Jeremiah was not disciplined. So they never arrested him for uh, telling them to go plant houses, plant, plant, build houses and plant gardens. They never arrested him for that, and that's what Shemaiah thought he should have been arrested. So that's what his letter was about. So in verses 30 through 32, Jeremiah wrote to the exiles concerning the false prophet, Shemaiah. So Jeremiah wrote the final letter. Jeremiah had prophesied a falsehood, but well, Shemaiah, Shemaiah had prophesied a falsehood or a lie that led the people to trust it. They trusted him. He was not sent by God. God would punish him and his descendants. We saw what it said it was going to do. None of them would live to witness the good things that God would do for the people. His chief offense was that he had spoken rebellion against God. So he was trying to do a rebellion. Y'all, this stuff be something else, don't it, when you break it down. Look at it. These folks were some conniving people. I'm telling you right. Man, they, I mean, they, they, all you have to do is when you read it and, and, and God open it up for you to see it, you're right, it can make a good soap. You can, you can, you can make a soap opera off this, like you said. And all you got to do is tell the truth when you read it. It's, it's, so, it's right there. These people were something else. So, um, yeah, next week, January 30th, we'll be in Jeremiah chapter 30. <laughs> <laughs> January 3rd, Jeremiah chapter 30. So until next time, be blessed by God, be a blessing to others, be a person of God, share your love, share your faith, share God's word, and share the blessings that you receive from God with others each and every day. Amen, amen, and amen.